I think one of the biggest are vehicles. And with electric vehicles today, just some techniques are different. For example, in, in a loss of control or you're on snow or something like that, where we would talk about just coming off the accelerator if I start to lose traction. Well, in an electric vehicle, because as soon as you come off the gas or the accelerator, it decelerates automatically. So now I'm using a complex dy vehicle dynamic and I don't want to do that because it's going to add to the skid. So there's just new techniques because of differences and changes in vehicles. And then obviously with, with the technology and all this, the systems that are coming in the vehicles as well. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we delve into the ever-changing and accelerating pace of global change and its impact on our lives. I'm your host, John Paul Flores, broadcasting live from the New World Studio. Today, we're diving into the world of AI and automation. As an enthusiast and expert in lead generation, I will guide you through understanding and leveraging these technologies for your business and for your personal use. And don't forget, AI and automation might be unstoppable forces, but that doesn't mean you are powerless. Tune in to learn how to make them work for you and not the other way around. But first, let's meet our guest. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we navigate the changing world around us. I'm your host, Jean Paul Flores, specializing in lead generation and AI automation, here to help you understand how our world is changing and what it means for you. In this episode, we sit down with Andrew Salier, president and owner of Drive Team Akron. Drew shares his insights on the evolving landscape of road safety and driver training. With over 15 years of experience in professional driver safety, fleet management, and DOT regulatory consulting. Drew discusses the challenges and the innovations in the driver training industry and how new technologies and regulations are shaping the future of road safety. Drew, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. By the way, just I want to congratulate you for having 50,000 students. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. It's our pleasure. We want to help as many as many drivers out there as we can. We've got to get them home safely every night. That's amazing. And before we begin on the in-depth questions, because I do have some, uh, can yeah. you share with us who Andrew is? A uh, few talk about your experience, your expertise, and what keeps you busy these days. Yes. So, so what keeps me busy? Uh, wife, uh, we have five kids. Uh, from 11 to 1, so they definitely keep us busy and, and chasing them around once we're, once we're done here for the day. But uh, my background actually started here as a student in our driver education piece and then uh, stayed on as, as summer help, uh, setting courses, uh, learning the ropes. And then in college, I actually started doing sales and marketing for our police and fire training. And then at that point, once I graduated, uh, started in our corporate training and, and working with our corporate clients and, and those with corporate fleets. And that was a big part of my responsibility for, for quite some time. And then uh, actually purchased the company from the founder in 2020. That's amazing. So you actually started with the Drive Team Akron as an employee first and you fell in love. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, going to college, not, not what I thought I was going to be doing. And then, you know, just the more ingrained got into what we do and why we do it and, and helping people. And I've always loved coaching and teaching and, and vehicles. And it has just kind of led down this path. And it's been extremely rewarding. That's amazing. And if you can describe to us what made you fall in love with this industry, with what you do, can you uh, share it with us? I'd say just number one is, is helping people and seeing that light bulb go off when they, when they get it, the, the progress they make in such a short period of time uh, with, with the training we're able to provide them. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely decking, working with people, um, and that is super rewarding. It's amazing. And for those who might not be familiar, can you describe to us uh, Drive Team's mission in driver training? Yes, whoever we work with, uh, 
driving is a skill. It still continues to be a skill, even with all the, the great technology that we have with vehicles today. Uh, but we still have to have those skill sets. So uh, we say turning driving into a skill, but more importantly, that everybody we work with, they get home every day. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. And what are the most common challenges in the driver training industry currently that you are facing? we see across the country um it's the distractions um even more distractions even with the technology understanding the technology how it works what it does uncertainty of of technology the phone uh many distractions plus all the distractions we've had for as long as we've had vehicles so i'd say that's probably the biggest challenge across the board is trying to manage that risk as we're going down the roadway do you notice that there's a lot more people who are getting more distracted more easily just because of how frequent they use their phone while they drive? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you sit at a traffic light and you see one and two, one and three people. They're holding it. They're sending messages on it. That, you know, the, Their focus is there instead of on the task at hand and getting from A to B. Awesome. And can you tell us what happened when COVID-19 pandemic happened how did you see a huge decline of students who might be knocking on your doors we so we were shut down for about a month uh from the state level in our training world but then once uh once they allowed driver training to continue after those four weeks um we were right back at training a lot of our commercial clients and our new drivers uh, and, and that has not stopped since from that standpoint. So there's still a lot of people that want to get a license, a lot more commercial drivers that want to be licensed, and there's still commercial fleets bringing in people and operating operating vehicles. So from that standpoint, it's been a little unique and obviously many, many challenges throughout those few years, but, um, but definitely still a lot of people that are on the roadways and we've got to make them safer. That's amazing. And can you tell us more about I remember you saying that you also serve corporate clients. Can you tell us how you actually do it and what you do for them? Yes. So with our corporate clients, um, from a fleet of five to 5,000, they've got drivers on the road that are driving their company vehicles or they're in their personal vehicle on business. Um, and with these miles, driving is the most dangerous thing that we do every day. When you look at all the industries, even police and fire, and driving or motor vehicle crashes is the number one cause of injury. It's the number one cause of fatality. So they have a lot of risk there. So we do 90% of that work is, is hands-on because we know when we train skills and we can affect decision-making for people behind the wheel, we can decrease motor vehicle crashes. Um, and not only are there people getting home every night, they're safe. Uh, you can decrease bottom line dollars by avoiding and minimizing those crashes that you're having every year. So that's a lot of what we do with refresher training, uh, new drivers to their fleet, uh, regulatory training with understanding commercial laws and how I'm affected commercially across the country and what laws I fall into from that standpoint with commercial vehicles and those kind of things. So that's where we do a lot of our business is working within utilities, construction, landscaping, engineering firms, but, but folks that are driving on, on company time. So for the new tech, I'm sure there's a lot of new technologies that helps people learn driving easier. Can you tell us what these technologies are and how specifically they help people? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you know, kind of the big three that were mandated in 2014, but they've been around for some time, is ABS, traction control, and electronic stability control. You know, ABS has been around since World War II, really came into vehicles in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, we've been teaching that for quite some time, but we still see people that don't understand it. And you know, ABS kicks in when I, as the driver, have applied too much brake pressure. And, you know, they feel this pulsation and they're not sure what that is. So they pull up, they panic, and we see you know, rear end collisions because of not understanding what ABS does or how it works. Traction control, electronic stability control, uh, traction control kicks in when I've over accelerated. Electronic stability contr control kicks in when this vehicle starts to skid or slide. And they're there to help 
Um, but we as the driver are still in control of that steering wheel, so we have to work with that system. And they're all tools, um, but I have to know how to use my tool within that vehicle to get out of those those bad situations. Um, a lot of the newer systems, you see the, the blind spot sensors, blind spot awareness in your mirrors, uh, lane departure, autonomous braking, adaptive cruise, you know, all these things, but just learning how they work, what they do. Um, when... In, in situations where they don't work or I get into construction and it's picking up things that, you know, on a normal road, it's fine. But because things have moved or changed, then I have to adjust because of those situations that I'm in. So understanding the tool and how it works and then using my, my skills and knowledge to make those adjustments as we go down the road. Is it common that when we, let's say, you're on a motorcycle and you have this ABS traction control, that when it kicks in, people get shocked by it? Yes. Yeah, they're, really? uh, if they don't know what it does or how it works, oh, they, they panic. Um, we see a lot of people, they pull up off that brake pedal, unsure of what's going on. It's just going to increase our stopping distance. You know, the, the nice thing about ABS is it still gives us steering control, um, but they don't, they don't know it because they don't understand the system. So it's a lot of just knowledge and, and understanding what we're driving. Yeah, but those things work genuinely, and they do save lives. Absolutely. I, mean, I remember a few years ago, I was in a motorcycle accident, where mm -hmm. the only reason I was in an accident were is I pressed the brake, and the uh, backside of the motorcycle caught in a plastic bag on a sand. Wow. So I think if I have ABS control, that would have been averted at all. Yeah, and with... And, with oh, a lot of the motorcycles today, they're putting even more of those systems on that they're yeah. putting in vehicles as well. Yes. Yeah, plus they're very dangerous, especially on the rain. Oh, yes. I can use, tra you and know, I can lose traction at any time. It doesn't have yeah. to be snow or ice like many people think. It could be a dry, sunny day. But if, I, if I'm going too fast for the conditions that I have, I can, I can lose traction. What are the most these? think motorcycles are more dangerous than four wheels? I think the biggest piece today is because so many drivers are distracted. The person on the motorcycle has to be so much more aware of what's going on and putting themselves in position for other drivers. Um, I think there's a lack of skill within our society to be able to operate that vehicle. Uh, People just don't grow up on those kind of things anymore. They're not in vehicles as much as even 20, 25 years ago. So I, I just see a difference from that standpoint. And they're harder to see. Uh, depth perception is harder for a motorcycle that's coming up in that mirror as it's coming around the curve. Um, so if it's behind something or there's a blind spot, it's just more difficult to see than, than the vehicles that are on the road. So I think that's the, one of the biggest pieces of why, why there is more danger there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can be the greatest, most safest motorcycle driver out there. And if somebody else is not that good, you're going to get killed. <laughs> can be. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, what motivates you to actually work in the field of driver safety and training? What makes you up every day and wants you to work and work on this industry? I think it's it is changing so rapidly, but... Truthfully, for me, it's the coaching aspect. Uh, that part I really do enjoy and love and, and teaching and trying to help people. Uh, that I think that's what get, gets me up in the morning and let's go make somebody better today. That's that's what helps me get, uh, get through every day. And you said there's a lot of new changes in the driver training industry. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so if you just looked at some of the new technology in the, the mid-2000s, you know, with, with a lot of these systems being mandated in 2014, commercially in 2015 to get a commercial driver's license, some of those laws changed. There's more restrictions to 2022 where they've mandated um, – commercial driver training for any new CDL driver if you're getting a, a class A or if you're going from a class B to a class A. But if I'm getting a new a new license as a commercial driver, um, there, there's training that has to be completed and, and those things. So I think we're seeing more because of the amount of crashes. So if you start looking at 2015, we since the 70s, our crashes have been declining every year. 
2015, they started to rise. And then in 20, we saw this huge escalation in motor vehicle fatalities and crashes across the country. And they're not going down. So because they're not going down, we're seeing, I think, more regulations, more things of people trying to get better there um, because we're at early 2000s numbers. I mean, we went from 33,000 fatalities in 2015 to almost 43,000 fatalities last year in 2023. Why do you think the crash number of crashes are getting higher each year? Um, lack of skill, yeah. speed, and distractions. Uh, we've got we have, these vehicles are incredible. I mean, they're so smooth. Uh, they they ride down the road so well, and I think a lot of people don't realize how fast they're going. Sometimes, uh, and, you know, the next thing you know, they look over and I'm doing 85 miles an hour down the highway and don't even realize it. Um, so we just see people going much faster. Um, I think there is a little bit of false sense of security with a lot of the safety systems. They think the vehicle can can stop on a dime, but you, you can't get past the physics of that vehicle moving down the roadway. It's just not going to happen, even though I'm driving those speeds. So I think a lot of that is the knowledge and, and building skill sets to understand what they're operating. Do you think there's part of it where... It's because most of the vehicles we drive there are automatic transmissions, so we don't actually get to be as much in the process as if we are driving manual transmission vehicles. I do think that is definitely a piece as well. Um, but you know, someone that does drive a manual transmission, they're more in tune to the vehicle. Uh, there, there's a lot more obviously going on from that standpoint versus just hitting the gas or hitting cruise control and going down the roadway. Uh, do you see a huge decline on interest for very young people to learn how to drive because of these autonomous vehicles? It's, it depends on where you live from what I've learned. Um, we're, we're close to Cleveland, Ohio, where, where we're at, and we still see a lot of people that want a driver's license. I'm noticing in more rural places or certain areas of the country, they're not as inclined to, I want my license at 16 years old. Um, it's just, it's not the need, but I think it's different in different areas of the country. Um, we do see a lot that, yes, I'm ready to go and they want that license the day they turn 16, but others, they're, they're waiting. Um, they're not as eager to do it. Is there any specific cases where maybe some driver or a student came to your offices and said, uh, you know, I've, tried to learn driving for a very long time and I wasn't able to do so and you helped them. Uh, is there any specific cases like that? Yes, and, and those are the ones that are exciting and fun and you're trying to figure out what's going what's gonna to help them get this independence because it, it still is an independence in, in the world we live in, I think, for the most part. Um, we probably get about two of those a year. Uh, you know, they, they tried driver's ed maybe when they were younger and – they, they just couldn't catch on, whatever the case may be. Um, it wasn't, they weren't quite maybe mature enough. They weren't ready at that standpoint. You know, now they're in their, their mid-20s. Maybe they went to school where they had transportation, where they didn't have to worry about getting places by themselves. But now they're, they're in a job or a career where they do need a vehicle. They need to know how to drive. Um, those, those we get a couple of those a year, and they're, they're very rewarding. Yeah, I bet they, those are the best feelings of the world, you know, being able to yes. help people who might be really scared and driving because it is such an amazing f feeling to just drive down the road, you know? I agree. And uh, do you have any tips for people who might be listening on how to be a better and safer driver on the road? Yeah, I'd say probably the two most important things, whether you've had it for five days or 50 years. Your vision and your space are the two most important things we have. And they say 80%, upwards of 90% of the decisions we make as drivers come from our vision, what we see, what we what we can process through through visual. And you know, there's there's kinesthetic and, and auditory, but the majority of our decisions are made through vision. And the biggest part of vision is spacing. You know, and you go down the road in many places and people follow so closely. And 
the physics just don't work out. If something happens, I physically can't get stopped, maneuver around that problem because I'm too close to the person that's in front of me. So, you know, we talk about three to four seconds of space as you go down the road and, uh, you know, why that's important, but it takes about a second to visually see it, another second to make a decision on what you're going to do. And then depending on what you choose is anywhere from three quarters of a second to a second and a half. So you see when you start adding this up, I need that time to to pick up and make decisions as I go down the roadway. But the biggest piece is which leads to that vision. And by backing off, I can just see more. I'm not reactive to the uh, to the person that's in front of me. So the and, I, yeah. and I think people don't realize this enough. People are generally bad at reacting. I mean, very yes. good at predicting things, but reacting very very slow. <laughs> Especially if I don't know what to do uh, or it comes to that situation. I've never been in it before and we see people panic and they just slam on the brake and that may not be the best solution or it may not even be possible to stop in time. So I may have to steer. Uh, but if I'm not trained or I don't know how to do that correctly, um, I'm steering into oncoming traffic or I put myself in an even worse situation. So they just have to understand what can they do and what can their vehicle do um, to avoid those types of situations or minimize them as much as possible. And, you know, it's such a scary feeling because it's not something that you generally can train for. I mean, you can train on it on some level, but you can't train it on, you know, repetition like most of the things that we learn. Yes. It, you know, and the only way you can do that, like you said, is hands on, you know, because we can have these conversations and talk about it. But for me to actually experience it and know what to do in those situations, yeah. that's the only way that we can train the brain to go back to that if I have that situation to encounter. Uh, in a rapidly changing world, where do you see driver training go in the next five to ten years? Uh, do you think there'd be more students or maybe less or what's your take on it? I think students will stay about the same, especially from a driver ed perspective, new drivers. Uh, I think we're still seeing a large amount of drivers with needing commercial drivers and those kind of things to operate commercial vehicles. I do think we're going to see, we have, we have technology we don't even know about yet. Um, we're going to see technology that's going to help and improve that we're, we're not training on, we don't even know it exists yet um, because it is tr changing so fast. But we have to be able to adapt. We have to be able to teach people how those things work. Um, I, you know, w with autonomous vehicles as, and those kind of things as well, we still have to be able to understand the vehicle and what's going on. And if I do have to manage or take over that vehicle in, in certain situations, what do I need to do as the, as the driver? So I'd say within the next five to 10 years, we're definitely going to see a lot more changes. But I do think because of the world we live in, that we still will have um, a lot of people still needing to get that, li that license and um, to move, move everything that, uh, that we have here in this country from, from coast to coast as well. <laughs> and since we're going to be seeing more technology, I mean, that's just not even a conversation to talk about just because of how many people are innovating. Uh, how do you how would you balance the use of technology for learning and still having that learning of real skill yeah I th you've got to teach the basic skills right a vehicle it goes it stops and it turns or some combination thereof so i have to understand that at a basic level i have to feel it i have to see it i have to know what it's going to do i still have to visually see all the things that are happening within my world as I go down the roadway. But then once I understand those basics, what's the technology doing? And, and I, you know, for example, the, a blind spot sensor. We see a lot of drivers, that blind spot, you know, they pass a vehicle and that blind spot sensor goes off. Well, now they think they have enough room to make a lane change. Well, that's not the case. It's just out of my blind spot, they're cutting people off. I still have to get enough space to properly make the lane change. So even though I have this technology and it's giving me good information, I'm the one that has to decipher that information and how do I utilize it the right way. Uh, so I think a lot of it is just training the brain to take in that information after I've built basic skill sets. 
And since you have trained more than 5,000 students, amazing again, by the way, uh, is there situations where people, while you're training them, they get panicky when they're on the wheel and they panic and make a lot of mistakes and even become a dangerous situation? Is there any cases like that? So what we try to do and what we talk about as, as instructors and our team is we're always driving ahead of the student. Uh, and, you know, and, and you know, just dealing with people, there's indicators. You know, people start to, maybe they get quiet or you can kind of tell that the nerves are kicking in and you, you just adjust what you're going to do for, for that lesson or what you're trying to accomplish for that day. You may have to back off a little bit. It may be, Hey, we're going to pull in this gas station here real quick. Let's, uh, let's go get something to drink and uh, talk through what we just saw and those kind of things. So always try and put yourself in position or you and your student in position to where that risk is manageable. Uh, and you never want to put on, I mean, you have to put them in as many situations and, and train them in as much as possible. Uh, but you never want to put somebody in a dangerous situation where you could put your, them, yourself, or, or someone else in harm's way. So always trying to uh, stay ahead in those, in those situations as much as possible. You know, uh, when I was learning driving, uh, there was a situation where I just start driving. It's in a manual transmission, and I'm doing great. I'm on the highway, and when I stopped, and then I went to the strat again, the panic just kicks in. All the panic that builds up that I haven't noticed while I'm driving because you can't notice it. So you're driving, if you notice it, it's going to be dangerous. It builds up. And when I tried to start that car again, I wasn't able to for 20 minutes straight. <laughs> it, is, it is tough, especially, you know, if I've never experienced that before, the, we, it's fight or flight. And if we don't know what to do, we do get into that panic situation. You're absolutely right. I forget even the most basic thing, which is just starting a car. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and you do see that when, when someone yeah. skids out or they, they lose control and that vehicle does turn off, you know, even though maybe everything's okay, um, yeah. but the, the body does panic and it's, there's uncertainty. And yeah, is those cases common? maybe more than, than what I would think at times, yeah. um, especially in bad weather, heavy rain. Yeah. Well, you know, that's when we see the major pileups. That's when those, those things tend to happen more. Uh, heavy rain, snow, fog. And in, in those situations, I, a lot of it is just, just more space. Now, there, there's, there's always a good chance that I can lose traction. But how do I put myself to minimize that as much as possible or if I'm truly unconfident, not confident, uncomfortable, uh, you may have to find somewhere safe to pull over and get yourself out of that type of environment until you're able to get back out on the roadway again. What advice would you give to someone who wants to enter the field of driver safety and training? Maybe he wants to be an instructor. Uh, what would you suggest to them to them achieve success? Continue to work on your skills. We have to train all the time. Uh, we, we just have to continue to get better as drivers just in general. So improving your skills, understanding the rules and laws uh, at a higher level um, and, and help, help, you know, when you learn something, teach others. Maybe, you know, it could be as little as proper hand position on the steering wheel. You know, go, go to classes that, um, where you can improve your skills because if I can improve my skills, it's going to make me better and able to teach teach others from that standpoint. Uh, but the, learning about the technology, um, you know, people that, that love driving, you, you know, you see in the SCCA world or uh, commercial training or, or just in driver's ed, uh, people that want to help people, um, improving those skills, learning more about the vehicles we have today and taking your knowledge that you have and your experience, and we can start teaching others. That's, that's the best way to go about it. And I know you have driven a lot of cars. I mean, you are a driving instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us what your five most favorite cars are and why? All right. So I would have to say my, the, my most favorite that I drove was a Ferrari. That was a lot of fun. I got a chance to, uh, to drive one of those. I'm a classic car guy, so I 
got a chance to get in a 69 Shelby, which was one of my favorites. Um, so I, I did enjoy that. Um, I drove a truck every day. So always those, if I got a chance to do some off-road racing, I think I would, I would jump on that one. Um, but probably your, your eighties Ford Chevy pickups for me. Um, and some of these new ones that are coming out, I got to do some more testing on to see what, uh, what their capabilities are, but I do like the classics. <clears throat> Those classic cars like the 69 Shelby, they take a lot of turns before you actually turn the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Much different uh, the, the, yeah. than today's vehicles. Yeah, they don't got power steering. You got to work for it. <laughs> yes. They were much stronger than we are today. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, they look amazing. Oh, they do. Uh, yeah. Those designs are beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, just, you know, timeless. And, you know, uh, what changes did you see or do you see or experience when you were first starting as a driver instructor from today? What changed within your industry? I think one of the biggest are vehicles. And with electric vehicles today, just some techniques are different. For example, in, in a loss of control or if you're on snow or something like that, where we would talk about just coming off the accelerator if I start to lose traction. Well, in an electric vehicle, because as soon as you come off the gas or the accelerator, it decelerates automatically. So now I'm using a complex dy vehicle dynamic and I don't want to do that because it's going to add to the skid. So there's just new techniques because of differences and changes in vehicles. And then obviously with, with the technology and all this, the systems that are coming in the vehicles as well. Uh, it's just different teaching all the cameras, and sensors. Uh, it is, there could be sensory overload. So what is that information coming into me? And I have to decipher a lot more than you did just 15 years ago. And you know, with those new electric vehicles, the rapid acceleration part itself is just scary, especially for someone who's just learning. There's a high risk of getting panicked just because of how mm -hmm. fast it can go with just one tap of the gas. Yes. And, you know, with that, it is, it's a knowledge of the vehicle and knowing what I'm operating and it just takes time and practice and getting somewhere, you know, if, if you've got a newer driver, that's going to be in one of those vehicles, get them to an open parking lot, let them feel that acceleration, let them feel the braking before I go out onto the roadway. And I've got so much more risk and other things that I have to process. I just need to be more in tune with the vehicle before I get out on the road with it. Um, so I think it is just kind of building some experience and building some skills in an environment that's safe or low, lower risk versus out on the roadway the first time they drive it. Let's talk about the trend of how many people are still using manual vehicles. Uh, do you see that there is, I mean, there is a definitely a huge decline on that, but how much decline did you see over the years? Did you say manual vehicles? Yeah, how much have they declined on popularity? I mean, most of the people now are using automatic ones. Yes. So the last stats I saw, which was a couple years ago, only 4% of the population can actually drive one. Uh, so that, that knows how to drive a manual vehicle um, and very few that are being manufactured just off the line. Most of them are special orders anymore. Uh, there, you know, there are a few lines that still have that manual transmission, but very, very few compared to, you know, even 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, do you think there's a reason why people prefer automatic vehicles now or just because it's easier? I think it's it's easier. Yeah. So that's just, you just um, call it trending that way, and you know, from the manufacturer standpoint, it's a different, um, different manufacturing process from from there. So they've gone, they've just changed because that's what most people wanted. And for you, uh, do you personally drive a manual or automatic? I've had both. Um, I do right now. I mostly drive my truck, which is an automatic. But, um, yeah. but I think and, uh, what, uh, 
what legacy do you hope you would leave behind in this industry? Because I know people have different goals within their industry. Uh, what's your specific goal that you want to leave behind? That, you know, whoever we're working with, uh, we're making them better. And that there's just one thing they can take away from, from one, one class that they attended with us and that they get home every night. Uh, you know, we, we, fortunately we've had opportunities to work with students that they're emergency room doctors and they're, they're doing incredible things. You know, maybe there was something that we taught that allowed them to stay safe on the roadway so they can affect even more people's lives. So I, I'd have to say that's, that's it for me. <clears throat> Man, those doctors and nurses, they're very brave, especially because most of the time they go home driving and they're half asleep. <laughs> there is, yeah. And what are what's next for Drive Team Akron? What's your hope for it? Do you hope for it to grow even bigger, or uh, do you just want to have better communication or uh, better help people? I would say bigger. Um, we have started that uh, these last couple of years, trying to expand where we're where we're teaching, where we're training, trying to affect more lives. Uh, eventually, maybe that's more more locations, but we are traveling with our training that we do, and just any opportunity that we can to uh, get in with companies or individuals that we can we can help make a difference. In, in their community, that's uh, that's what we're working towards. So trying to trying to grow. That's amazing. And uh, do you have any last message to people who might be listening? I'd say above anything, know yourself, where your skills are, um, know know what you're driving. Um, you'll make good decisions, so you get home every night. So that that's that's what I'd leave them with. Awesome. And by the way, I forgot to ask this question. Uh, if let's say there's just a dad who wants to teach his kid how to drive, you know, uh, because some dad who likes to do that, how would you go and tell the father what to teach the kid or how to teach the kid on how to yes, drive? Yes, so um, very begin you know, beginning process. Uh, get, get them to a parking lot first. Well, first and foremost, they're watching us, right? So you've got kids that you know they're, maybe they're getting ready, they're not there yet. Uh, they're watching everything we do. Uh, even if they are on that phone in the back seat or whatever the case may be, they're watching. So our habits, the things that we're doing behind the wheel, we need to be good examples. But then as you're starting that training process, parking lot's a great place. Um, the brake, the accelerator, just getting used to going back and forth, proper hand position. We want them at nine and three or eight and four, lower half of the wheel from a steering perspective, from the airbag perspective. So lower half of the wheel, um, getting used to that, just basic right and left hand turns, start introducing the signal because for this new driver, as they're building this skill, I mean, their vision's this big. They, they just don't see what you or I do as they're going down the roadway. So we've got to build some skill sets uh, first. It's going to take, depending on the student, you know, 50 to 60 hours of just practice building skills. And then once we get past that point, you start to see the decision-making process start to change. So from there, starting in a residential type neighborhood, maybe moving to rural 35, 45 mile an hour roads, starting to build that and then getting into city type traffic, lots of lane changes, right on reds, busy intersections, um, moving to downtown and highway. So just kind of working through that process um, and maybe different number of hours at each, each, each area. Um, but yeah, kind of just working from there, but starting in a parking lot and building those skills and then helping develop their decision making. And uh, why do you say that when a student is starting to learn, they have this much vision? Is that because, you know, they're so focused on just this one thing, one turn that they're doing that that's all they can see? Yes. Uh, there's, there's so much that the brain is processing just to develop that skill. So they say the first one to a hundred repetitions is just learning the very basics, right? And we're, we're doing all these things, um, at once I'm, I'm steering, accelerating as I'm making the turn, where am I supposed to look all these things? The brain is trying to, to make happen. Um, you know, that, that next, hundred to a thousand repetitions you're actually just 
you're improving and getting better at the skill. So that's why I say, you know, they just, they just can't process that much. Um, you know, they're looking down the road and you're seeing that that light turned red and they haven't seen it yet. They're looking at the vehicle that's right in front of them and they haven't hit their brakes yet. So they're not either. Uh, so we just have to develop those because then we can start expanding vision and what they're picking up on. So the brain can process more because it's, it's just, it needs that time. <clears throat> Awesome. And for our last question, do you think uh, personally we should try and strive to a fully automated uh, car future? For me personally, I love to drive. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it's not that I wouldn't get in one of those, but I, I enjoy driving. So I still want to drive. Um, I think we're a long way. Uh, to, the technology, I think, is going to get there quickly. But I think laws and the environment and infrastructure uh, it's going to take much more time but i like to drive i still like that so i'm gonna i'm gonna still get in a vehicle that i can operate mm -hmm. that's amazing and i hope we stay that way for a while because i'm just a kid i still want to have the ability for a car manufacturer to create these amazing cars for me to try uh -huh. <laughs> absolutely and where can people find you yes so um Driveteam.com is our website. Um, try and put stuff on our, our social media as well to give them tips, different things that, that can help them with them and their families and, and drivers. Um, so any of our social media, if you just type in Drive Team, I'm happy to help with those and, and ask questions if there's anything we can help with. Awesome. And I do see that you're very active on LinkedIn. <laughs> try, try to get as much uh, out there as we can. <clears throat> Awesome. And again, thank you for joining me today. Absolutely. My pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. That's all for today's episode of the New World Podcast. We have explored some fascinating topics with our amazing guests, shedding light on the upcoming New World. If you enjoyed today's episode and today's discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to the podcast and if you found value on what we have discussed please consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform remember if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to get to cover or if you are interested in being a guest in the future please feel free to reach out to me via links in or email me at john.paul at aicinix.com and add new world podcast all capital in the subject line so i can see it I always love hearing from our listeners. And don't forget to check out our amazing guests. You can find more information about them by the contact details we provided earlier. Again, thank you for tuning in on the New World Podcast. I know your time is very important and I try to always make the next episode better than the last. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, keep innovating. This is John Paul Flores signing off from the New World Podcast.